What's going on you guys? My name is Zach Hartley and welcome back to episode three in this podcast. I am very excited today because we are going to be interviewing a gentleman by the name of David Atwell. Now I met David on my recent trip to Montreal when I went to go check out some real estate with a company called Addy. I met David, we had a few beers and we toured around a few properties and I was blown away by not only the amount of knowledge that David had, but the amount of knowledge that he was willing to share with me in such a short period of time. He is truly a wealth of knowledge and in this episode, my only goal is to try and share some of that knowledge that David has with you, the audience. So I'm gonna be asking him questions to learn about his story and his business. And if you get any value out of it, please remember to click that like, click the thumbs up, leave a comment down below, follow up with David. I'll put all of his contact information down below. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please remember to click that subscribe button and let's jump right in. All right, David, thank you so much for joining me here on the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm great, Zach. Great to see you again. Thanks for coming out to Montreal a couple of weeks ago, checking out our Addies. It was great to have you. Yeah, it was great to be there. Montreal, absolutely beautiful city. I want to get back there as soon as I can. And I want to talk about that Addy in just one second. But first, can you give us a quick introduction? I met you, I've chatted with you, and I kind of know what you're up to. But, yep. but lay some numbers on us. How many doors do you own? What does the property look like? What are you up to these days? Why is this episode going to be important to our viewers? So my name is David Atwell. I am the co-founder of HoneyTreeGrow.ca. Uh, we're a private equity real estate company. I began investing at the age of 24 uh, with about $32,000 saved up. Today, we have about $50 million in holdings under our belt. And of that, we, we have 75 hotel rooms, about, say, 100 multifamily doors. And in 10 years, like $32,000 into $50 million in holding. I mean, I'm so proud of that and so happy to tell you about that on this podcast. Perfect. And that is the reason that we are here. I am so excited about this. And you said you did that in 10 years? Yeah, I started November 2011 was my first my first deal. Six bedroom student rental in Barrie, Ontario for 275,000. Okay, beautiful that. Okay, so let's let's start with that. So how you decided one day you want to go buy a rental property and get into real estate? Or what was the motivation there? Did you buy it for yourself? Like, how did you decide, I want to put some money into real estate? I was like 22 years old and I knew I wanted to own real estate. I knew how quickly the market goes up in value and how important it is to compound money, especially if I'm aiming to retire at the age of 65, the sooner I get my money invested, I could have upwards of 40 plus years of compound interest. I just knew I had to get that money in quick and living in a student residence when I was in college, I mean, 600 bucks a night or a room per month, six bedrooms. I mean, the math really added up quite quickly, right? So I knew I just needed to save that money and get that first house under my belt. So, so you, I assume you were working a part-time job while you were kind of going to school. What was that like? And then you finally saved up enough money. Did you go 5% down? How did you buy that first property? Yeah. So I had graduated from college in 2009. I started, I believe it or not, I was a beekeeper, which is something people find pretty interesting. Cool. I, <laughs> I started a, a small beekeeping operation in 2010 but I also had a full-time job in the movie business, uh, doing craft service, serving food on film sets. At the time, I just graduated. It was the tail end of the global recession. I just needed some money to get A, my farm, and B, to save up for a house. And so I just saved as much money as I could, working crazy hours. Um, the first purchase I made, I had $32,000 in the bank. I knew I had a decision to make. I could either make a 10% down payment on a $275,000 house, or a 5% down payment on a $540,000 house, $600,000 house with closing costs, right? And so I, I chased after the cash flow at the time, which admittedly was a bit of a mistake. I could have bought a, a fully detached house in Toronto for 600 grand at the time, but that's okay. You know, you learn over the years, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so it sounds like you went for the 5% down there and you were chasing cash flow. You say that was a mistake. And yeah. it's because the opportunity, the opportunity cost was that you gave up buying a house in Toronto. Is that what you're saying? 100%. And you'll find that in most real estate investments. When you chase after cash flow, you're going to be in higher cap rate markets and you're going to have slower appreciation. Now, things have changed quite a lot in the past 10, 12 years. But at the time, you know, if I bought that $600,000 house, I probably would have lost $500, $1,000 a month. I could have pulled that off, but it was uncomfortable. But that made so much more money than that student rental would have over the past 10 years. Interesting. Okay. I feel like that that's a very important lesson to learn because for a lot of new people trying to get into real estate, buying that first property, it feels like cash flow is probably the only thing they care about. So would you say that 
maybe take a second look and reevaluate that for new real estate investors? A hundred percent. Appreciation is the most important thing in real estate investing. And if you're young and you're getting into the market and you can afford to wait, let cash flow sit there on the side. Don't even don't even acknowledge it because you have to pay tax on that cash flow anyway. And and like I said, when you get cash flow properties, they tend to have higher cap rates, which means the appreciation is slower. Picture buying uh, like a. A, a, a rental property outside of the city versus something downtown Calgary or Toronto, that downtown property is going to appreciate much faster. And that's where you get your really big growth in real estate. And I think what you said there about taxes also makes a lot of sense. It's like selling stocks. If you never sell your stocks, you never pay tax. But if you're collecting dividends every single quarter, you pay tax on the dividends, right? hundred percent. If you have cash flow coming in, you're losing it to tax anyway. So why do you really want it at such a young age? Save that for your retirement when you can convert your, your high equity growth investments into a cash flow investment and then start to benefit off of that. Very, very interesting perspective. Okay. Um, I want to come back to this, but let's continue along this story. So you save up your, your 30, 30 something thousand dollars. You go in and you said it was six rooms that you were, yeah. you were doing. Yeah. So you acquire it. I assume you're renting it out to some buddies and some people or other students. Talk to us about that process. How was that like? And then what was the next step? <laughs> so believe it or not, I had actually moved back home with my parents after college. And I was living in the basement, saving my money. But I bought a rental property outside the city. So I didn't live in that house. I didn't even rent to my buddies. I reached out to my landlord in college. And I said, hey, Anna, I just bought a rental. Can you manage it for me? And, and sure enough, she got six, six students in there for me. Uh, but meanwhile, I was living at home with my, with my parents in the basement, right? And, and so when I actually bought it, I was going to tell my mom, but she was like, you better not be buying a rental property because you're going to lose all your money. <laughs> Sorry, mom. <laughs> you're going to lose all your money. You don't know what you're doing. This is a terrible mistake. So I actually had to hide it. And I got a, I got a PO box to get all my mail sent to at Shoppers Drug Mart while I was saving money on rent by living at home for another couple of years. Oh my God, that's amazing. So you had a property <laughs> with six rooms in it, but living at home with parents to save money. And, and yep. I assume cash flow was the priority at that point. Yeah, cash flow um, was really helping. And were you, were you working full time as well? Yeah, I was in the movie business. At this point, I had transitioned from craft service and then I was actually working as an accountant, kind of like a, a bookkeeper controller kind of role for the construction department, overseeing budgets, you know, getting really good at building some cool Excel calculators and, and tracking systems in the movie business cool. and just saving as much money as possible to buy my second property a couple of years after. And I assume that the work you did, especially with the Excel sheets and the accounting and the budgeting really helped with regards to looking at properties in the future. hundred percent. I would build some amazing calculators, deal analyzers, because, you know, a deal comes up, you don't have a necessarily a lot of time to analyze it. They're accepting offers on Tuesday. You just found it on Sunday. You really got to crunch those numbers quick and, and see if it's a good deal for you. Right. So Excel, my God, my favorite program ever just build some cool calculators to analyze deals and, and quickly determine if you want it or not. Um, can you give us the, what were the three main factors that you used to evaluate deals back then and then now, and has it changed? So back then it was really just the ability to buy a property. I mean, when you're buying residential consumer real estate, which is four doors or less, you're being qualified using your personal income. And at the time I was making probably like 70, 75 grand a year. So it was pretty tough to get a mortgage even then. I was just looking for the ability to qualify. The second piece was, okay, could I actually debt service all these holdings that I had? I didn't mind living at home for a couple more years in my early twenties because I knew that real estate was going to go up in value. So that, those are really my only two requirements. Can I finance it and can I debt service it and, and just hold for long-term growth? Now my requirement has changed completely since then of what my, what I'm looking at in deals. For sure. And that, but those initial, those initial factors were completely based on the, the concept that real estate goes up over time. Is that That's right? Yeah. And it was quite naive and it was quite arrogant. It was just like, I'm assuming real estate's going to go up in value. And sure enough, it did. But uh, it was really, I just going to hold it and see what happens in over 5, 10, 15, 20 years kind of thing. And I assume that, well, clearly that worked out pretty well. Yeah, so, um, okay, so you got the first property, living at home, 
making some money here and there. Was there a change in mindset or was it the same grand vision all the way along going into property two, three, four, five? Or was there like a light bulb where you're like, oh, this could be cool? Yeah. So once I had my third property, so I had two student rentals in Barrie and then a condo in Toronto. And I had to fight to even qualify for those mortgages. And at that time, I was starting to learn about house hacking equity, pulling equity out to buy the next one and buy the next one. Because the third property I bought, I didn't make any down payment out of pocket. I just pulled equity out of the first to buy the next. But I had quickly discovered I was at my limit. I was not going to be able to buy another property. And I was starting to wonder, like, how do these real estate investors have hundreds of doors if they can't qualify for a mortgage? And that's when I started to learn about commercial real estate. And once you have that commercial real estate asset, the financing is a, complete, a completely different game. And it's a much better environment to be uh, buying in anyway. And that was really shifting gears at that point. And so, so you kind of hit the limit personally, and then you were almost forced to shift to yeah. the commercial side of things. Is that what happened? That's, a, that's 100% it. I knew I had all this equity in these properties. I knew it was trapped. And I was not going to be able to buy more homes or more properties. How do I shift gears at this point? And so I just spoke with somebody else. It feels like they're sort of in the same situation at around 12 doors. Why does that happen? Um, why, why is that the situation? So when you're buying consumer residential real estate, as I mentioned, four doors or less, the lender is not looking at the property itself. It's looking at you and your ability to borrow money and your ability to service debt. And they have very stringent rules on that. They look at your line 101, your line 150. So if you're self-employed as a tax strategy, you have very low income. Uh, you're just unable to borrow very much money. Once you get over that consumer uh, commercial side, which is five doors plus, now they're no longer specifically looking at you. They're looking at the income of that commercial property and how much debt can it service. And that's how you're able to grow a portfolio to hundreds of doors because it's the commercial side where the financing is just spectacular. Gotcha. So you acquired the two or three properties. And then what does that transition look like as an entrepreneur that wants to go from from the personal side to the commercial side? How does somebody make that transition? What's required? What, is, what are we not thinking about when I go through that in my head? Yeah, so I had to make the uncomfortable decision to actually sell properties. And, and that's one of my golden rules is never sell good real estate. But I actually learned student rentals aren't necessarily the best asset to finance. You're limited at most to 65% loan to value. So if your property is worth 5 million, you have at least 1.5, uh, sorry, $150,000 worth of equity stuck in there. I had to accept the fact it was time to sell off these residential properties and, and take that equity and move it in over to the commercial side. Gotcha. Okay. So did you sell all three or did you sell just two or one or how yeah. many, how did you do the transition? Yeah, so I sold two and I'm actually in the condo right now. When I moved back from Montreal, I, my tenants had moved out. It's a furnished rental. I said, all right, I'll take it for a bit. I'm working on buying another property right now. Uh, so I sold the first two student rentals and then, you know, cashed out, paid the realtor fees, paid the taxes, which obviously isn't great. But now I have this nest egg and I'm, I'm putting it into commercial real estate. But what had happened by that point is my, my friends and colleagues in film, you know, they notice I'm 27 and I have, I've done so well in real estate. They're like, can you invest our money? Can we invest with you in deals? And now suddenly, I, you know, I go from having the equity from my student residence to a couple other investors pulling in, a, you know, about a million bucks to start buying apartment buildings together. And that was really that transition where I've proven myself to my peers and now they want to grow with me. Yeah. And I feel like that's the biggest thing is nobody wants to give a couple hundred thousand dollars to the guy that's never done it before. But once you've kind of done this a few times. That's right. Like I didn't even really ask for it. I was just like, what'd you do this weekend? It's like, oh, I bought a house. I sold a house. So, you know, they see me doing all these deals and suddenly it's like, okay. And they see my work in, in film. It's like, okay, you know, I trust this person. I see, I've seen what they can do. Very exciting. Okay. So so you got your nest egg from the residential side, you go in and what was the first commercial property that you got into? That was a 10 plex in Barrie. I bought it for $1.15 million. I remember being so nervous about buying a property over a million. That seemed like such a massive number. This was only about six years ago, remember? And oh, wow. so a hundred thousand dollars a door in Barrie, like my God, that was incredibly cheap at the time. 
it, yeah, like you say, 10 doors for 1.15 million. I'm like the house down the street from me sold for 1.15. It's, it's exactly crazy. right. Yeah. It's incredible what's happened. Um, okay. So you get that first property. What happens next? How do you grow this portfolio into where it's at today from your first commercial property then? So that's when you really start to learn about the multifamily value add strategy and, and that the value of a property isn't based on opinion, it's based on the net operating income. And so now I'm starting to learn, it's like, okay, I have some crappy units, they have low rents, tenants have moved out, what can I do to increase the value of those units? That's when you start to learn about adding amenities, adding uh, laundry, adding air conditioning, and realize that tenants will pay more if they have a nicer home. And so by putting the money into the property, you're actually driving the, the NOI up, which is driving the value based on the cap rate. And that was really the next game changer was understanding that if you increase your NOI, you can actually increase your debt, increase your leverage and pull that equity out and go buy more properties. I use the analogy of growing a tree. You plant those seeds into the ground, you take care of it, but after time that tree will grow and apples will come off of it and you can go plant your next tree and your next tree. And that's that's the analogy of honey tree. That's where honey tree comes from. It's this burr strategy. I love it. Um, burr, so walk us through burr for somebody that doesn't know that, doesn't understand it or never heard it before. Yeah, so that's an acronym, buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat. That's the concept. If I buy a property that is has really low income and that is really undesirable, and I put the money into it, I renovate it and refinance that new value, you're able to take that equity out and repeat the purchasing process again. The next important thing that you need to learn as an investor is when you sell properties, you're paying realtor fees, you're paying uh, capital gains, taxes. And if you sell a property, you're likely owing in a net about 80% of its value. Well, you can take that to a bank and leverage 80% of the value. So you're pretty much right at that same starting point. Why on earth would you sell this asset if I could continually leverage it and refinance it and buy the next property again and again? And that's why the Burr strategy is actually so powerful. So the idea, so is this what you did with the 10 plex then? That's it. Yeah. And so that money out, gave it back to the investors, put it back, my own money back in my pocket and, and kick that forward in the next deal. And so walk us through the strategy here when you, so you've bought the building here, you've got a couple of tenants and you say, okay, these tenants are coming up for, or their, their lease is expiring. Um, I want to just get them out and then renovate the unit and charge a higher fee. Or what's the actual process to doing this? Yeah, so I'm based in Ontario. And so the, the landlord tenant board there, uh, you can't terminate anyone's lease, they always have the right to stay there as long as they want. And that's something that I totally respect and appreciate. Typically, when you buy older properties that are a little bit run down, tenants grow out of it quicker anyway. So the tenants that I, the tenancies I had, they all moved out on their own, their own decision. But it was after, you know, I walked through one of the units after the tenants moved out. I'm like, this place, I would never want to live here. You know, how much money is it going to take? 30, 40 grand to, to, to renovate it. And that's when you start to realize it's like, okay, if I can actually reposition this property, make it a better place to live, get better tenants, higher rents, less issues, that's a better product, a better asset and a better bus business to own and something that banks love. For sure. And so you make those changes and then you go back to the bank and you say, hey, because I'm charging higher rents, I have a higher net operating income, which means this property is worth more. Can I refinance, take some of that money out and then go buy the next one? Is that what you're doing? A hundred percent. And so when you take a property to a bank, they're, all they're doing is calculating your stabilized NOI. If they know you have $140,000 left over as stabilized NOI, that's when they start to calculate how much debt you can borrow. And that's what they'll base it off of. For myself and as an investor, I'm always trying to leverage up to 100% loan to cost. For every dollar that went into that property, I want back through a mortgage. And the faster that I can do that, it means the faster I can go buy the next property and have this little tree that's growing. So I'm always watching the NOI. I'm trying to find a, the fastest way possible to increase that NOI and then take that back to a lending institution where they're going to calculate, okay, how much mortgage can this property debt service and get up to that 100% loan to cost metric. And when you say stabilized NOI, what what is the calculation to stabilize it? Is it like an average of two years or how do they calculate that? So they do look at your historical income. They look at your 
uh, and expenses. They look at your actual expenses, but often what happens, especially for younger first time investors, you go to a bank and say, oh, but I manage the property myself and I studied carpentry in school. So I know how to do the maintenance and repairs myself. Therefore my costs are zero. The bank's gonna say, nice try. They're going to stabilize that expense and say, okay, that's great that you manage it yourself, but the actual cost is 8% of revenue and they deduct that from your NOI. So maybe you present it as $140,000 NOI, but then they said, okay, but you still need to add in your maintenance and repairs, your property management. They're going to chip away at that NOI and say land at maybe $125,000 or $120,000. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Um, and so you're going back to the lender. Do you, are you going to the same lender each time and trying to build a relationship there? Or are you shopping around these mortgages a bit? Yeah. So typically speaking, I work with the same lenders. It's such a headache to get a mortgage. They need so many documents. They need so many credit reports and all this stuff. When you have that rapport, they already have that history on you and they know that you've been making your payments. It's far easier to get your next mortgage just by keeping it in-house. Plus that, that representative from whichever lending institution you're working with, they're really going to appreciate your business and they're going to, they're going to try their best to keep you happy. For sure. That makes sense. Um, okay. So you've got the 10 plex here. Uh, you bought it for 1.15. What did, what were the next big steps here? What did you, what were you able to refinance it at? Or will you, can you share that with us? Yeah, no problem. So today it's worth about 2.4, 2.5 million conservatively. Wow. And yeah, not bad for six or seven years. I mean, it was only about a four or $500,000 down payment, right? And oh about four, 400 grand. That's got, the total cost basis is 1.6 million. And it's worth, let's say 2.4 for easy math. So, you know, 400 grand is now worth 1.2 million in, in five or six years. I mean, it's, it's incredible, but I've already exited that capital about two years ago. Yeah. I've had a, a, a CMHC insured mortgage for 1.6 million for about two years. So I've already taken that $400,000 out and happened to use some of it to buy a hotel in Montreal. It's constantly kicking that equity forward to that next acquisition. And that CM, CMHC, my understanding is that you can get some pretty favorable terms with them as long as your property kind of meets these requirements. Um, and you can get up to like a 40 year amortization rate. Is that correct? Is that true? Yeah. And is that what you do? 100%. So basically, when you buy a property, you're transitioning it to something that is really undesirable for a bank to something that's amazing. And so you're looking at the different tiers of lending, there's A, B and C. A money is your bank. That's where you're getting the absolute best rates, the absolute best terms. B money is a higher risk lender. It's an equity based lender. They're taking on greater risk at a greater cost. And then there's private money, which is the absolute highest cost of borrowing. And it's typically a property that's so undesirable, A or B won't touch it. When we buy these properties, we're buying usually using B or C money and turning it into caviar, as I describe it for a bank. Banks love caviar. And so when you take this completely stabilized property at its highest and best use where the income is completely maximized. That's something that CMHC is going to look at. That's something that they love. And that's when you're really getting your best mortgage terms. You can get up to 40 year amortization. So your monthly payments are low. You're getting a CMHC insured mortgage. So you're paying an insurance premium on that loan. So in the event, if I happen to default, the lender doesn't lose any money super low risk for them, which means I get a lower interest rate. And that's going to kick out a lot of cash for long term. Gotcha. And so going back to where we started this conversation, does it kind of shift where if you're a retail investor buying your first property, you should be focused on that kind of capital appreciation. Whereas if you're a commercial investor, the focus needs to be on net operating income. Yeah. So for, for a retail investor, you're looking for long-term growth, especially if it's your first deal. Mm -hmm. If you're too young, you're too early to get cash flow. You want to just get long-term growth. But once you get flip over to that commercial side, it's entirely a game of monitoring that net operating income and maximizing the revenue and the operating expenses of that property and just driving that value. Gotcha. Okay. So um, now now, what are you up to now? How are things going? I went and saw the hotel with you uh, the other day. What other kind of properties are you in right now? And, and how does everything work for your business? Yeah. So, I mean, in 2018, I became incredibly frustrated with the multifamily value add market. And, and that's 
probably the best place to be investing. It's so reliable. It's so consistent. The problem is with, with the rise of say like Keyspire and Rain, you're getting a lot of weekend warrior investors who are just bidding like crazy on, on multifamily assets. And I was starting to get really frustrated. So that's when I shifted, I pivoted my business strategy. I'm going to start looking at other assets. And that's when I discovered this hotel concept that we're now acquiring in Montreal and Quebec of the digital concierge, the extended stays uh, hospitality model. The problem back then in 2018, nobody sells hotels. They're, they're great assets. So I was becoming quickly discouraged after a couple of years of looking for hotels. I wasn't able to buy any. And then lo and behold, 2020, the pandemic occurred and suddenly there's hotels everywhere that are on the market. And so I've really shifted outside of multifamily value add where it's extremely hot to buy in. There's a lot of speculation and I've gone to a more logical place, in my opinion, where you're buying distressed businesses at lower costs that have just apparently ran out the pandemic, help them exit and bring them back up to their highest and best use back up to their maximized value. Okay, so that business model is really unique. I'm I'm into one of the uh, properties with you, so I'm really into this. But Thank you talk, so much. let's talk let's talk about this concept because I think what you said there is probably the most important part. Where these hotels are great assets, and then COVID hits, and mm-hmm. the world turns upside down for these hotels, and they just don't have yeah. the traffic, they don't have the traction, and now it feels like we could be on the come up. But if there is somebody that's been running this hotel for the last two years and struggling motivation might be a factor for them. And so you guys are swooping in and saying, hey, nice to meet you. We can solve all of your problems. And I think there's an opportunity for us as well. Is that what's happening here? Like the the yeah. big picture behind it? A hundred percent. You know, a lot of these hotel owners, they've been running their business for 10, 20 years. The business already has been changing into the tech digital concierge world. And so for a lot of these operators, they've been operating in the same way for 10, 20 years. They don't necessarily want to change and they don't want to change their business. They don't necessarily even have the capital or they may not even know how to do it. So that was something that was already happening in the background. Now you add in a business that hasn't had revenue or 50% of the revenue for two years. They just want a good clean exit, right? And so that is a huge opportunity to make money on the buy. Uh, and, and that's really what our focus is. We're finding hotels, these people, they just want to exit. That's fine. We'll take them out. And then we're going to convert that property anyway. And let's talk about that conversion. You, you talked about digital concierge. I've heard them called smart hotels. Talk to us about uh, you walk in. What does the renovation look like? What, do, what does the finished product look like? Yeah. So the first thing we're looking at is the the networking and cabling requirements. How do we actually operate these, this cool, smart hardware? We're using Salto locks. We're using smart electrical panels, uh, water meters, stuff, all that kind of stuff. Uh, How do you actually power that? And so the first thing we have to do is install our networking and cabling requirements. Now we're looking at the spaces within the hotel. I mean, if you have a front check-in area, that could potentially be a room. If you have a buffet area, like people don't want to eat buffets anymore in a COVID environment, that's no longer valuable. We're, we're looking to convert that unused space into new revenue. And then finally, the last piece is how, how does that actually look? What's the aesthetic of these rooms? Does it need to be modernized? Can we add amenities? Can we add kitchens? Do they need laundry? Do they add AC? It's all about adding value to that traveler so that when they get there, they're getting as much value for every dollar they spend. And that's really what's going to drive your your reviews and your return on that investment. So there's a lot of things that we're looking at when we go into a deal, but it's really about increasing the revenue, decreasing the expenses, and then exiting our capital, stabilizing the asset. Gotcha. And so for a customer that's going into one of these hotels, are they, they're doing everything through their phone, everything is digital. And if they need something, they call somebody or how does that process work? That's right. So we use a third party platform that has built the system for us. It's kind of like Android where we can white label this, this, this process as operating system and call it our own. So when a guest goes to check in, they have the ability to download an app. I know not everybody loves to download apps, but this one is very powerful. So you may want to, uh, they're given a door code. Uh, they, we know their arrival check-in is going to say 4 p.m. That door code is only active at 4 p.m. So you don't have to worry about past guests coming back in and trying to, to use their old code. And, uh, and that deactivates when they check out. So that's the first thing. They get, they, they get to create their own experience and access their own property completely on their own. And this happens automatically. We don't have somebody sitting behind a computer emailing out codes. That uh, is beautiful. That, 
that that's one of the strategies to lower the expenses and increase the NOI, right? Yes. And then additionally, we have a team, a remote team of people working to manage multiple locations. So rather than having one person on site at every location, we can have one person managing four or five locations to get the phone calls, to get the, if there's an issue in the middle of the night. But at the same time, the application can streamline that as well. And where a guest can say, hey, I need something, I need a towel, but we have smart lockers set up on site where a guest can go get, we can give them a code to a smart locker where they can find a towel. So it's really building in everything that a guest needs and, and streamlining and automating that process to a remote team of managers that really brings down that operating expense. No, I love it. I think it's cool. So can you share with us any sort of the rough numbers that you would look at? Like what's a good price to buy a door or a hotel at in this, in this kind of market? What, what can you kind of turn it into? And then my other question is, how long do you wait on a property before you go and try to refinance it? Yeah, so I'll answer that question first. So we try to refinance it as quickly as possible. We're typically, when we do our multifamily value add deals, it can take anywhere from three to five years to see any NOI growth. And we're trying to return 50% of capital within two to three years and 100% of capital within five years. Because we're buying hospitality and we're so quickly able to renovate and increase the value, we're looking to exit 100% of the capital within two years, which is something that I absolutely love. Because if I put a hundred thousand dollars in or 200,000 and I'm getting that back within two years, but I still hold that highly cash flow asset. So that, so that's the first part of the question. Um, and then in terms of acquisitions, so we're looking at buying at about 120,000, 140,000 a door, uh, is kind of like the number that we're looking at right now. It can cost anywhere from 30, 40, even $50,000 a unit to, to upgrade it and to renovate it. But once it's completed, I mean, we're at about $250,000, $260,000 a door post-renovation, which is a great overnight bump on that, on that NOI and that valuation. Yeah, it seems phenomenal. And then you have that cash flow the whole time. And is the long-term plan to never sell the hotels or do you plan... Do you have a strategy for that over the long term? Yeah, so I don't plan on selling these ever, really. Um, like another amazing metric looking at Quebec, you know, we're buying at $300 to $350 per square foot. I'm based in Toronto. The average condo is about $1,000. Vancouver, it's well over that. So if you can imagine $300 a square foot for good downtown real estate, like that, that's incredible. Um, yeah, one, you've got me thinking right now, I need to go do the math in Calgary here. Yeah, I, I haven't looked too closely at the Calgary market, but I, I have a feeling it's going to start picking up again, especially with what's happening with oil right now, right? Yeah, if we see oil around 90 to to $100, everybody's making money. So um, we should see <laughs> That's it That's fantastic. Um, I so interrupted the plan, you there. No, that's okay. Um, the, so the plan with the property is just hold it long term. Pull that capital out, 100% loan the cost, and, and hold it long term. The best part is, you know, hospitality can be volatile, but because we have these kitchens built into every unit, we have the ability to operate as multifamily as well. So if there's some sort of disruption to tourism, we're putting in a long-term tenant, we're getting a traditional traditional occupancy, and we're going to ride out that storm. So it's a very versatile asset and a very comfortable asset to hold, but in the best times, you're getting great cash flow, which is just unheard of in Canada these days to begin with. For sure. And I assume it also gives you the option to go to the bank and say, hey, you can value it as a hotel or you can value it as multifamily, whichever 100%. one you prefer, right? Lenders love it because, it, like I said, lenders are always looking for the worst case scenario. If for whatever reason I default on my mortgage, they're coming in and they're going to say, how do we get our capital back? How do we service our own debt? And by having private kitchens and bathrooms, banks love it compared to a traditional hotel and we're able to get better financing terms. Yeah, no, that makes total sense to me. I love it. So uh, where are you at right now with these hotels? I'm invested into one with you through the platform called Addy, which is great. Link in the description to this video if anybody's interested. But um, where are you at? How many of these hotels do you have? How many doors? And what does the future look like? Yeah, so we have three hotels in Montreal specifically. Uh, the first will have 27 doors. The second will have 23. So what's that? That's 50. And then the, the final one will have 26 plus one re uh, commercial retail. So 77 doors in Montreal. Uh, we're closing on one in Quebec City at the end of the month. Uh, sorry, at the end of March. Or sorry, at the end of May. Uh, we actually bought our neighboring property to the most recent Addy. And we're going to look at severing the land in the back and building an addition to the existing property 
of, of 2048 St. Denis, which just dropped out Addy. In fact, they, they, they did a shock drop of another 250,000. Uh, so anyone listening could go scoop up a couple extra shares if they want to. Um, and then we just acquired, or rather we just got under contract an $8 million hotel in Quebec City. And, and that one we're actually looking at converting into a Sonder, which is a, a really cool, sexy brand that's emerging in the hospitality industry. Talk to, I've never heard of Sonder. Talk to me about what that is. Yeah, so Sonder, the the CEO, he's a Montreal based. I believe he graduated from McGill, and he was, I guess, one of the first people to start implementing this digital concierge, Airbnb style head lease hotel. So it, they create a high end hospitality experience. They have their own in house app. I think they're in thirty five cities all over the world, and it's just an amazing, beautiful brand. They're really spearheading this. And, and so when we look at this $8 million deal that we're looking at buying in Quebec City, it's not our traditional one to two star boutique hotel. It's actually a four or even five star hotel. So you're going to have some really demanding guests, really high value propositions. And, and that's just not something, a space that I want to be in. But when I look at it, I know there's an overnight value where I can say, okay, let's take this property. Let's lease it to Sonder. Sonder is going to be able to use their technology the same way we do to de decrease the operating expenses, but they can push the rev par, the revenue per available room, because it's such a sexy brand and such a sexy platform, it's going to increase that value overnight. And, and so that's, that's one of our first turnkey hotel deals where we're just going to hand it off to Sonder and hope that we can create a good burr strategy out of that in the first couple of years. Beautiful. And do you work with Sonder going into that deal? Like, I mean, I, the first question that comes to my head is what if they don't lease it from you? Yeah. So if they don't lease it to me, then I'm just going to walk away. So we just signed off on the, on the NDA and we're starting to dive into the numbers. Now I happen to know, having spoken with Sonder previously, that they don't have any deals in Quebec City. And that's a market that they're really wanting to get into. And we would be so honored to be their first hotel in Quebec City. So we are going to start looking at it. We are starting to underwrite it. I do suspect that we'll be able to hit a rental number that makes sense and that we can justify. And so I'm really excited to see the outcome. But if for whatever reason it doesn't work out, you know, frankly, I'm probably just going to walk away from this deal because that's not my space. I'm not into high-end hotels. I'm into one to star, one to two-star boutiques. I love it. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, how do you know when it's time to walk away from a deal? How do you know when it's just not the right fit for you, even though, even if some of the numbers look good. Yeah. So number one thing I would look at is speculation. How much am I speculating the success of this project? If I can't foreseeably underwrite a great return and a great exit strategy on my capital, that's not a deal for me. And so uh, like tons of investors and even my first deal with, with my student rental in Barrie, that was a speculative play. I, I assumed real estate was going to go up in value, but I didn't have a clear strategy other than buy and hold. So that is number one. How much am I relying on speculation? And frankly, there shouldn't be any at all. It should be completely foreseeable how much value you're creating and what your exit is. So when, so, when you go into one of these hotels then and you buy, you buy the door for 100 and it's worth 200 later or whatever the numbers were, how do you get those numbers? Obviously, you buy the hotel and it has 20 doors, so you know what the first number is. But how do you figure out once you renovate it for 50 grand, then it's worth 100, 100 grand more. How do you get that number? Yeah, so there is public data available, and I do work with my operator to get that information. For example, on average, an Airbnb that has a fully functional kitchen will make $800 more per month than an Airbnb that does not. So that's, that's some real quick data that we can rely on. Secondly, we're working with our appraisal, uh, appraisal company. I prefer Collier's International, where they're actually doing a deep dive on other hotels in the area and looking at the, the, the historical revenues, what their average daily rate is, what's being offered with that average daily rate. And so in combination, you do have to spend a lot of time looking at your hotel and what else is in that area. You're working with your operator and you're working with your actual appraisal to say, okay, we're buying at a $90 ref par. And after we spend $40,000 per unit, we think we're going to be at $100 per uh, ref par. And we, we're confident that that's achievable. We're never over promising. It's always under promise. Uh, lower your own expectations so you can set yourself up to over deliver. 
for sure. But you're getting those numbers from other comparables in the market than most of the time. hundred percent. Yeah. It's very quantitative. It's stuff that's out there in the market. Very little of our opinion goes into it. We're actually looking at other properties, other Airbnbs, other hotels in the area and calculating it. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so for a first time investor that's going out trying to look for their first deal, let's go back to that for a beginner yeah. in the market. They've got, let's call it $50,000 saved up, $100,000 saved up, depending on where they live. How would you recommend somebody to get started in the real estate market today um, when trying to buy their first property? Yeah. So the first and most important thing I learned was don't wait. Do not save up for a bigger down payment. You know, I was born in the late 80s. And at the time, my parents had crazy interest rates. It was like 15, 20%. They always taught me saved up as much as possible before buying a house. That does not apply today. We have interest rates that are below 3% and, and appreciation's going up like crazy. So if you even foreseeably have a 5% down payment on a property, take it. Just get into the market if you can. Get a condo. If you need a roommate, do what you have to do so that you can debt service it. That's my first piece of advice is don't wait. Gotcha. And then would you, like if somebody had that kind of money saved up, would you go and try and buy your first property? Would you... Um, focus on residential? Would you go buy an apartment? Where would you focus um, your search? So it, it depends on how much money that the person has saved up. If we're talking like 50 to 100,000, just get a single, maybe a single family home, maybe some suburban area, an hour outside of a major downtown core, something with a higher cap rate, or even get a condo for yourself that you can afford to live in. Mm -hmm. Just get something, right? And it's going to be completely up to you. I learned the hard way. I should have focused on appreciation rather than cash flow. But this was 10 years ago. Prices weren't nearly as outrageous. And, and I had that comfort. I had that ability to choose. So in today's market, it's whatever makes sense for you. If you can get into that $500,000 house and it's a rental property, or, or rather you live in one suite and rent out a basement, do it. And would you, would you still say that that focus needs to be on the capital appreciation rather than the income from the property. Yeah, I would 100% focus on the capital appreciation. Gotcha. Especially if you're in your 20s, like this is your time to grow. You don't need passive cash flow, even though it's nice. And your income's growing, your career's growing, your tax bracket's growing. So the more ca passive cash flow you have, the more it's getting taxed anyway. So just focus on long term growth. For sure. And if somebody wanted to house hack and grow their way up from that first property up to up to where, where you're at and try and get into that commercial space, what advice would you give to that kind of person? So the first thing is hire a mortgage broker. I, I hate to say it live publicly. I never work with banks. Banks have some of the most outrageous interest rate differential penalties. They look great going into the mortgage. It's when you exit, that's when you get these crazy penalties. So hire a mortgage broker. Find someone you trust and work with them who can explain the type of mortgage you're getting into. Previously, I explained A money, B money, C money. Um, so just work with a broker and someone that you can trust. That would be my first step. The second piece there is relearn asset ownership. Our, my parents taught me pay down your house as quickly as possible. That would have made sense when if I had 12% interest rate or 20% interest rate. Now it's actually the opposite. You should be increasing your debt as much as you can and taking that equity out and, and putting it into better assets or other assets in general. So number one, get a mortgage broker. Number two, refinance and pull that equity out. The um, And I think so that's a really important part. I, I just had a conversation with a buddy the other day. He bought a house and he's trying to accelerate his mortgage. And I asked him why. And he said, I just want to have less debt. Um, but in reality, um, not doing that and investing that money <laughs> would be a better return for him or would it, it would increase his net worth faster. Is that is that right? hundred percent. Like if you take 20% of your equity out of your property and put it into commercial real estate, I mean, you can safely double it every five years. Say you're working with $200,000. Well, in five years, that's 400,000. If you really want to pay off your home faster, take a chunk of equity out and pay it, liquidate those assets after five years, and then pay off your house. You're going to get it done way faster and you're going to have more disposable income in the process. For sure. I completely agree with you. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, so mortgage broker, think about asset ownership with regards to the interest rate you're paying and what you can do with that money. Um, yep. 
what other equity. points would you have? Sorry. I yeah. So I'm always aiming to be at 80% loan to value. As soon as I see I'm at 50% loan to value and, and for beginner listeners, what that means is what is your loan amount compared to the value of the property? If you have a $300,000 mortgage and your property is worth 600,000, that's 50% loan to the value of the property. That means you have $300,000 of equity or 50% equity in there. That's a lot. And there's a big opportunity cost on that money. I, I put it at about 12%. So number one, get up to 80% loan to value. 80% of 600 is 480,000. You'd be pulling out $180,000 to reinvest and you're making 12%, 8, 15%. So, so get that equity out and reinvest it. The next piece is minimize your monthly payments. So maximize access to capital, minimize monthly payments. And there's two ways to do it. If you're rate sensitive, interest rate sensitive, you're going to use an amortized mortgage. You'll get the lowest rate, you can re-amortize it over 30 years, and that'll give you the smallest monthly while you're still paying down your debt. If you are payment sensitive, use a home equity line of credit because that is interest only payments. The rate's slightly higher, but because you're only paying the interest on that on a monthly basis, your monthly payments are much lower. So your next question is, am I interest rate sensitive or am I payment sensitive? For me, because I like to grow, I focus on keeping my payments lower so I can buy more highly appreciating assets. And you do that because you can get a better return than even that higher interest rate compared to the HELOC, compared to the home equity line of credit. Is that right? A hundred percent. So my debt service is far more comfortable. I'd have more cash flow, and I'm more comfortable to grow in larger equity growing investments. Gotcha. These are golden little nuggets. This is beautiful, David. This is <laughs> it took this me is like what five or six years. It took me five or six years to figure this out. So this condo specifically, I have finance up to 80% loan to value. I use Tangerine and 65% of it is on a HELOC at a rate of about 2.4%. So if I'm borrowing $480,000 at, let's say 480,000 at 2.4%, that's only $1,000 a month, $960 a month. And if I'm taking the equity out and now I'm going to say buy a hotel, I mean, now I have $200,000 I've taken out of this condo and I put it somewhere else. And so personally, that, that's my strategy is I, I use a HELOC. And so do you, do you kind of do the math and when it drops to 60 or it drops to 50%, you, you kind of call up the, the boys in the finance department and say, hey, what can we do? 100%. Now, the problem is I have this condo, I have a rental property in Barrie, Ontario that I'm about to build some townhouses on. You know, I'm already maxed out on my mortgages. From, from a tax strategy, I don't pay myself a lot of money on my line 150. So even I can't qualify it. I've been doing this for 10, 15, uh, 10 11 years, right? Uh, so yes, it would be as soon as the value goes up and I see I've gone from 80 LTV down to 60, I'm calling that bank and I'm getting that 20% equity out because I'm going to go crank that out into another deal. Gotcha. And so do you still hold some of these properties personally and then other properties commercially? Yeah. So I mostly use holding companies. Uh, I try to actually bundle properties together under, under one corporation. Say I have a property that's stabilized at its highest and best use, and it's kicking out, say, $2,000 cash flow each month. Well, that's going to get taxed. So if I bundle that with an underperforming asset that I'm repositioning, that's going to offset and that becomes a tax strategy. Okay. Beautiful. Interesting. Huh? So, yeah. So like rather than taking the cash flow and spending it and paying tax, yeah. I'm going to go buy a property that needs work. It's losing money every month, but it's going to balance out. And now as a portfolio, they're all growing together and they're supported. That's like a silo. It just sits by itself over there. It takes care of itself yeah. and I can grow that and maximize that income. And not pay tax on all the profits and cash flow that it generates. Absolutely beautiful. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and then is it difficult to separate those out after? I assume you sell it to it a is. different holding. Oh, I wouldn't even sell it. What I would, in fact, what I would do is I would take that bundle to a lender and say, okay, I don't want one mortgage. I want five. And, and when you go from getting a million to $2 million mortgage to getting a $10 million mortgage, lenders love it. And they want to do that whole portfolio, that bundle. So by having everything under one roof, one entity, Every property has the same entity registered on title as the beneficial owner. That bank, that lending group is going to just treat it as one big mortgage and you're getting better leverage, better terms, better everything. 
so so you're bundling all these properties together and when you go to refinance them you say hey instead of doing it separately just do it all together as one mortgage yep. or presumably a better rate and better terms yeah you know because if they're doing they're doing the same amount of work anyway so they want to sell 10 million dollars with the mortgages instead of just one or two and yes. so they're they're really going to like you for that interesting okay wow um I'm trying to pull more golden nuggets from you right now, David. I'm running out of questions. An, I have another great one. So yeah. as a, say you're a homeowner and you're like, great, I bought my house five years ago. And I've, because I've listened to this podcast, I now realize I'm at 50% loan to value and I have 30% equity I can take out. What do I do with it? You have two questions to ask yourself. Do you want equity growth or do you want monthly payments? Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with monthly payments. And when I'm, you know, 50, 60 years old, I am going to get those monthly payments. But what you can do is say, instead of taking that 30% equity, let's call that $200,000, instead of investing that in equity growth, you can now become a private lender and you can lend that at say like 12%, which is like a second mortgage, a very reasonable rate on a second mortgage. So if you just increased your mortgage and you refinance and you took my steps, you said, okay, I'm going to go up to 80% loan to value and I'm going to use home equity line of credit for monthly payments only. Now take that $200,000 and lend it and you're getting $2,000 a month, you'll be surprised. You can actually likely cover your entire monthly payments of owning your house entirely and be mortgage payment free tomorrow. And so that's one amazing thing that people can do with their home equity. And so where do people go to? So I, I've just done those steps. I've got my $200,000 check. Where do I go to put that to make 12%? Because that seems like a fantastic return. Yeah. So feel free to reach out to me at honeytreegrow.ca. I can help explain where people can lend their money. Uh, Honeytree borrows money at about 12% interest on, on our acquisitions because it helps drive our equity growth. But also talk to your mortgage broker. If you have a great mortgage broker, like I explained, you should, and they helped you get that 200,000. Well, they can probably find a great place to, to lend that. Now, for me personally, though, I don't like lending to individuals in single family homes. There's just a bit of an ethical dilemma. If somebody needs $100,000 because they're down on their luck, I don't feel good charging 12% interest. But I do, I don't have a problem lending that to an investor like myself, because say if I'm helping someone with their down payment on an apartment building, and I know they're making 20, 25% because of my help, that's a win-win business relationship. And so typically mortgage brokers do deals to individuals, but I would want to be lending to other businesses like myself. So again, honeytreegrow.ca, I can help point you in that right direction if you feel the same way about lending money. But uh, there are great ways to get 12% out there and there, there is a market for it. Beautiful. And if people want to learn more about you, they want to reach out to you or contact you, is, is that website the best place to go or where can they get a hold of you? Yeah, so follow us on Instagram at honeytreegrow and also check out our website, honeytreegrow.ca. Uh, click to su subscribe to our newsletter. And if you'd like, book a meeting with me. I coach young people all the time with how to manage their current acquisitions, their current holdings and how to better grow it. In fact, at one of the Montreal meetups, uh, somebody that had reached out to me a month prior came there to meet me specifically. And now I'm coaching him on how to build a garden suite on his property. So, so book a call with me. I'm more than happy to coach you through it. Uh, I don't charge any money. I really just love helping young people with their real estate portfolio and showing you how you to shift gears into commercial real estate. David, I think you've helped a lot of people uh, with this podcast and sharing this information with us today. So I really, really My appreciate pleasure. your time. I will put links to all of your stuff uh, down below in the description to this video and this podcast. Thank you so much for your time. And is there anything else that you want to share with us today or anything else that you want to tell people before we sign off? Yeah. So don't be afraid of getting into commercial real estate. I was intimidated at the first time. It really is the place to be. So feel good shifting out of residential, getting into commercial, uh, check out addyinvest.com. Make sure you become a member because they're dropping some amazing deals. If you're a young person that's struggling to get into the market and you know, it's going to take three to five years to save up for your down payment, you can start putting $1,500 increments into deals. And you actually have that beneficial growth along the way. So become an Addy member, start dropping money into their deals. They're coming every month or, or weekly is their goal. Uh, and then check us out at honeytreegrow.ca. Uh, and if you're an accredited investor, reach out to me as well, because we have some amazing hotel acquisitions coming up, which is making amazing cash flow, unlike the multifamily market right now. So check us out. I love it. Thank you uh, for your time, David. I will link everything down below. I am also investing through Addy and uh, I just put into the last hotel that actually David bought. So 
definitely check it out. I am a uh, happy investor so far, and we will see you shortly, David. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Zach. It was a pleasure. Talk soon.